Look at the moon. It looks like blood. The sky is dark and filled with smoke. Rumblings can be felt in the ground. An eerie silence rules the night. All that can be heard is the cawing of lonely night creatures. Is this the night? Has the hour come? Is Armageddon and the end of the world upon us? This picture is a common theme seen and heard in science, religion, and politics today. TV channels and newspaper tabloids are filled with apocalyptic scenarios similar to what I've described, with fear being the prime motivator. A classic example of this rambling fear was witnessed during the turn of the millennium. According to the fear merchants, massive starvation and total economic collapse would occur as a result of a simple year-date computer glitch known as Y2K. Early computer software designers of the 1970s did not take into account the millennium change that would occur on January 1st of 2000. The dating analog rhythm found in early computers would not make the millennium change, but would roll back to 1900 instead of 2000. Apocalyptic fear was rampant, caused by this Y2K panic, and this was especially true in the Christian community. The common message heard was that total social and economic collapse was upon us. Therefore, Jesus must be coming back. A survivalist mentality came into numerous political and religious groups during the last months of 1999. We held our breath as the crystal ball in Times Square in New York City dropped counting down the last seconds of 1999. Would all go black? Would all electrical power fail? Lock your doors and prepare for chaos. The end was here. The new millennium came and nothing happened. The world did not end. So ended the Y2K panic. A new scare has arisen in recent years around the year 2012, because this date is significant on the ancient Mayan calendar. Apocalyptic pundits project that this year marks the end of the world since the ancient Mayan calendar no longer chronicles dates beyond this year, or so the fear merchants say. From catastrophic global warming to planet killer asteroids, to mega earthquakes and global pandemics, the future of planet Earth and the human race looks dark and bleak. Fear of the unknown is the driving human force behind all these apocalyptic scenarios. Fear fostered by bleak end of the world scenarios drives people to murderous ends. Jim Jones, the pastor of People's Temple on November 18th of 1978 drove over 900 members in his commune in Jonestown, Guyana to commit mass suicide out of irrational nuclear apocalyptic end time fear. The same can also be said of David Koresh, the leader of a branch Davidian religious sect, a radical religious group obsessed with millennium fever. He was responsible for the murder of 76 men, women, and children at Waco, Texas on April 19th of 1993. In 1992, nearly 20,000 members of the Damai Christian sect in Korea, also known as Mission for the Coming Days, were convinced that Jesus would return on October 28th. Members of this group quit their jobs, sold their homes, and left families. It is reported that some of the women in this sect 
even underwent abortions in preparation for the rapture. When October 29th rolled around, massive disappointment gripped the group and the members turned their anger on the leaders of the sect, especially Lee Jang Rim. In October of 1994, 48 members of the Order of the Solar Temple committed suicide out of irrational apocalyptic fear. The Supreme Truth, a Japanese doomsday cult in 1995, set off nerve gas in a Tokyo subway as an attempt to start Armageddon. During the last decades of the 20th century, the well-known Children of God, Christian Commune, also known as the Love Family, in the Seattle, Washington area, meticulously maintained an end-time countdown that would culminate in the rapture of the church. The group existed from 1968 to disbandment in 2004. It was obsessed with apocalyptic fears. Christian religious groups are not the only ones driven mad by millennium fever. Marshall Applewhite and Bonnie Nettles, founders of Heaven's Gate, an American UFO religion, manipulated 39 cult members to commit mass suicide on March 26th of 1997 in order to spiritually unite with a UFO hiding in the tail of the Hale-Bopp Common. Again, apocalyptic fear of the future drove this cult to extreme ends. Over the centuries, several famous secular prophets inflamed the common populace with apocalyptic scenarios of massive holocaust and death. The 16th century shook with fear at the cryptic quatrains written by Nostradamus. The 20th century was equally obsessed with the catastrophic global destruction seen through the eyes of Edgar Cayce, also known as the Sleeping Prophet. The predictions of astrologer Gene Dixon and psychic Ruth Montgomery filled newspaper tabloids with sensational headlines of the Antichrist and coming disaster. All of this hysteria points to the fact that our basic human psyche has a primordial need to know the future, to have a stable life in the midst of a changing world. The Greek Stoics of the second century BC taught of reoccurring intervals of the world being destroyed by fire. Virgil, the Roman poet, also envisioned the end of the world, but he also wrote of a coming golden age when life would become nearly divine. Several Eastern religions also predict the end of the world. Hinduism reckons time in terms of four cycles, each cycle beginning with a utopia and ending in destruction. According to Buddhism, the great Buddha will one day appear and usher in a golden age of peace. All of these religious and secular people throughout history have one thing in common. They were driven mad with millennium fever. The Antichrist may already be living on planet Earth. Armageddon is coming and the world will drown in its own blood. The apocalypse is upon us, and we shall all die. Phrases like this can be seen everywhere, in movies, on TV, and in newspaper tabloids. It is clearly evident that words like Antichrist, Armageddon, and Apocalypse can inflict fear, but these words are not political or scientific terms. Where did these phrases come from? 
All of these concepts come from one source, the Christian Bible. The idea of an apocalypse has come to symbolize an assortment of end-of-the-world scenarios. Environmentalists see global warming as a soon-coming apocalypse that will destroy the Earth, while astronomers envision a killer asteroid ending the world. Various government agencies see nuclear war or a worldwide pandemic as the apocalypse that will be our demise. All of these theories use the word apocalypse to describe their concept of worldwide destruction. But all of these fear pundits use the word in error. In truth, the apocalypse is a Greek and Latin word that means to remove the cover. The word has the application of an uncovering or revealing of a divine secret. The apocalypse is a form of literature claiming divine authority to reveal hidden things and future events found only in the purview of God. This form of writing was popular in Israel from about 200 BC to about 100 AD. The most famous use of the word comes from the Apocalypse of St. John that we know today as the book of Revelation, the last book in the New Testament. Apocalyptic literature generally employs a highly symbolic language that is subject to a wide range of interpretation. We see this type of symbolic language in the New Testament book of Revelation and the Old Testament books of Daniel and Ezekiel. Over time, the word apocalypse evolved into a secular idea that symbolizes end-of-the-world scenarios or events of mass destruction. The word lost its divine revelation element to fear commercialization. God has been lost in the use of the word. Let's find him again. The same commercializing evolution that corrupted the Christian usage of the apocalypse also distorted the concept of Armageddon. In some cases, Armageddon and apocalypse have been used interchangeably to describe the same end-of-the-world scenario. A classic example of this interchange is a sci-fi movie, Armageddon, directed by Michael Bay and produced by Jerry Bruckenheimer. The movie depicted a classic apocalyptic scenario of a killer asteroid nearly hitting the Earth. Armageddon is a word that finds its source in the book of Revelation. Let's read. Revelation chapter 16 verse 16. Then they gathered the kings together to the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. The context of the 16th chapter and subsequent chapters of the book of Revelation clearly describes a final conclusive battle between the triumphant Jesus Christ returning to the earth and the armed forces of the Antichrist. Armageddon is Greek for Har Megiddo, the Hebrew name describing Mount Megiddo on the southern rim of the plain of Jezreel in Israel. Again. Over the centuries, the word has evolved into a generic description of a vast, decisive conflict or confrontation. Another name that is in common use today is the New Testament concept of the Antichrist. The name has come to symbolize a person or institution that produces great evil. For decades, various fringe political factions, left-wing or right-wing 
have viewed our presidents as the Antichrist. Left-wing liberals called President George Bush the Antichrist because they believe he led the United States down the path of oblivion, while radical right-wing conservatives call President Barack Obama the Antichrist for pushing the United States down the path of socialism. These taunts are just classic examples of the misuse of the Antichrist figure seen in the New Testament. The root of the Antichrist comes from the writings of the Apostle John in his epistles. Let's read. 1 John chapter 2, verse 18 and verse 22. Dear children, this is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it is the last hour. Who is the liar? It is the man who denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a man is the Antichrist. He denies the Father and the Son. 1 John chapter 4, verses 2 and 3 This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming, and even now is already in the world. 2 John verse 7 Many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Any such person is the deceiver and the Antichrist. These four references are the biblical root of the Antichrist doctrine. Other references in the New Testament have been linked by Bible teachers to John's concept of the Antichrist, such as the man of sin and the son of perdition referred to by the Apostle Paul. But these scriptures are subject to a wide range of interpretation. The concept of the Antichrist is still vague, clouded with personal bias. Some Bible prophecy teachers believe the Antichrist will be an evil man, the final adversary of Jesus Christ, who will arise during a seven-year period known as the Tribulation. Other Bible scholars believe that the Antichrist is a metaphor for the ongoing battle between good and evil within ourselves. Who is right? Who is wrong? Again, these are questions subject to a wide range of interpretation and debate. The media has caused the New Testament concepts of the Apocalypse, Armageddon, and the Antichrist to become common everyday words. Do we understand these concepts? Has their constant misusage caused these three images to be lost in personal and religious motives? These questions are not new to our generation. Each generation of Christian thinkers following the apostolic age has formulated their own opinion about the Apocalypse, Armageddon, and the Antichrist. Each theologian claimed their personal insight into the Book of Revelation and the Book of Daniel was the only correct interpretation. In some ways, each opinion was right and each was wrong. Over the centuries, this debate between competing interpretations of the Apocalypse has turned violent and bloody. What is the issue that drives men and women mad with apocalyptic fear? The issue is the end of the world and the millennium reign of Jesus Christ. Who would have thought that one verse 
in the 20th chapter of Revelation could cause such trouble in the body of Christ for nearly 2,000 years, but it did. Revelation chapter 20, verse 6. Blessed and holy are those who have part in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. Why is there such confusion? Doesn't this verse clearly say that the saints of God will rule and reign with Jesus during his 1,000 year reign? Yes, this verse does make that assertion. But the timing and location of this event is the sticking point. The millennium reign of Jesus Christ has been a hot topic of debate throughout church history. Even though we may like the prophecy interpretation of Hal Lindsey or enjoy the Left Behind series written by Tim LaHaye, these writings only reflect one point of view in the midst of numerous interpretations of end time prophecy. The millennium is derived from the Latin word for a thousand that has come to symbolize a 1,000 year period of peace and blessedness ushered in by the second coming of Jesus Christ. Throughout church history, three schools of thought have predominantly determined how the millennium of Jesus Christ would be interpreted. These three disciplines are premillennialism, postmillennialism, and amillennialism. These positions differ as to the nature and time frame of Christ's second coming and his millennial reign. Some theologians in church history insist that the millennium of Jesus Christ is a symbolic metaphor used to describe our personal internal struggles with the authority of God. While other theologians strongly believe the millennium will be a future event that will change everything. Who is right? Who is wrong? No one knows for sure. Only time will tell. Let's explore each school of thought. Premillennialism is the view first articulated by the early church. This view teaches that Jesus Christ will literally and physically return to the earth and establish his kingdom. Jesus will usher in a 1,000 year reign of world peace known as the millennium, and his return will end the chaos and destruction of the Antichrist. Premillennialists tend to be pessimistic about the future of mankind. They tend to see only dark roads ahead. This doctrine teaches that only the second coming of Jesus will save mankind from utter destruction. The premillennial position also tends to interpret Scripture literally. Postmillennialism is a theory that began with the writings of Daniel Whitby in 1703. But some historians believe that the roots of the doctrine can reach back to John Calvin's exposition on the Lord's Prayer in the 16th century. Postmillennialism teaches that Christ will return at the end of a future golden age. This doctrine teaches that the millennium will come in a less violent way, with Christians gradually converting and reforming society into a near-perfect social and political state. This view puts great emphasis on completing the Great Commission recorded in Matthew chapter 28. Postmillennialists 
tend to interpret scripture in a spiritual way and are optimistic, believing that human efforts will help inaugurate the millennium. They interpret the millennium found in Revelation chapter 20 in a figurative way, tending to believe that the millennium is descriptive of a long period of time. A. Millennialism interprets Revelation chapter 20 in a metaphorical, symbolic fashion. These teachers do not believe in a literal millennium, and they do not believe Christ will establish a literal earthly rule before his final judgment. This point of view asserts that the 1,000-year reign of Jesus Christ is a symbolic metaphor used to describe the current church age with Jesus reigning spiritually as king in the body of Christ. This point of view does assert that Jesus will eventually return in final judgment to usher in a glorious new heaven and earth. But it denies the concept of a literal 1,000 year reign. The roots of this theory can be traced back to Augustine, Bishop of Hippo in the 5th century. Each school of millennium study asserts that their point of view is the only correct interpretation of the symbolic imagery found in the Bible. There is no room for differing opinions. Throughout church history, the Bible has been and still is the final arbiter of millennium thinking, but it is also the bloody battleground. To conclude this episode, one other word must be clarified, and that word is eschatology. This word comes from the Greek word eschatos, that means last, an ology that is translated the study of. When these two words are combined, we come to the definition of the study of last things. The word was first used in English around 1550 and is considered a part of theology and philosophy. The word has the application of the study of the final events in history and the ultimate destiny of humanity. Webster's Dictionary defines eschatology as a branch of theology concerned with the final events in the history of the world or of humankind. The word is also a belief concerning death, the end of the world, or the ultimate destiny of humankind, specifically any of various Christian doctrines concerning the second coming, the resurrection of the dead, or the last judgment. Why is the definition of eschatology important? Because it is the root cause of millennium fever throughout history. The study of eschatology is not unique to the Christian church. Nearly every social group has some apocalyptic concept on how the world will end. To fundamentalist Christians and radical environmentalists, the future of humanity is dark and bleak. While to a New Age humanist, the future of humankind is a nirvana, rosy and pink. We as a people want stability, and the idea that our world could come to an end is a fearfully sobering idea. The idea that someday we will stand before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ can be a fearful prospect. How do we handle these possibilities? We develop theologies or philosophies that help us cope with our inevitable demise. What is Millennium Fever? 
millennium fever is the eschatology we believe that helps us to understand who we are. We interpret everything through the glasses of our personal views on eschatology. What we see influences our worldview, our religion, and our politics. World history is drenched in the blood and smoke of competing views of end-time prophecy. The perception we maintain of the end of the world can drive us mad. Take a long, hard look at the insanity brought about by Jim Jones, David Koresh, and Marshall Applewhite. Millennium fever drove these cults to extreme lunacy and death. Don't be too hard on these cults, thinking that couldn't happen to me, because you and I are more like them than we dare to admit. If we are not careful, our eschatology can spiral into millennium fever that could have dire consequences. Stop and think. What type of eschatology glasses are you wearing?